how do you follow two great messages? Well, thank the Lord. I'm just giving my testimony, and I'm not sharing the word of God. <laughs> but, guys, um, you know, I'm humbled to, you know, be able to come up here and just to, you know, boast about the Lord. God has been good to me. You know, before we get started, um, let's just uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for God just being so good to us, for bringing us here, for waking us up this morning, for putting breath in our lungs, Lord. We thank you for your grace and for always being compassionate towards us. And, Lord, that your compassion, they never fail us, and they're brand new every morning, for we need it. And, Lord, we thank you so much, Father, for sending your only begotten Son, Lord, who shed his blood, that we can be forgiven. We thank you, Lord, for giving up your life to pay the price for our sins, that we can be redeemed. And we thank you, Lord, that you defeated the power of death and you rose again. That, Lord, today we don't have to be held in bondage to the power of sin. And so we give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. It's because of you that we are here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, guys, I stand here grateful and thankful for the grace and the mercy of God. You know, brothers, look around you in this room. Look around you in this room. You see the grace and the mercy of God all over, you know, men in this room. And guys, I am just another man who God has been so good to. And you know, my te- this is my testimony. I grew up in the city of Baldwin Park. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a, a Catholic home. You know, guys, in the world standards, I had good parents. They loved us. You know, they provided for us. You know, my father, he was there, but he wasn't there. He was often out with his friends. You know, my mother, she was the rock of the family. She did her very best to raise us. You know, guys, one thing that I remember growing up as a Catholic is this, that I was going to go to heaven because I was water baptized as a baby. You know, guys, my father being away often and this thought that I was promised heaven because of water baptism, you know, guys, it really impacted my life in such a negative way. You know, my, my, um, you know, it, it, it would, and guys, it would make me to, you know, make the wrong choices that I would make growing up. And so, guys, from a very young age, you know, I was exposed to pornography, you know, and and from a very young age, I became sexually active. You know, in in high school, I started to experiment with drugs. You know, I had done marijuana, I've done cocaine, and I started to drink. And, guys, eventually I would, you know, get um, introduced to methamphetamine. And, you know, guys, I would waste the next 15 years of my life, you know, with the life that was revolved around meth. You know, guys, I got involved in manufacturing meth and selling meth, and guys, eventually I got addicted to meth. And for almost those 15 years, guys, I used meth daily, multiple times a day. And, you know, it was rare when I didn't use meth. And, and so, guys, um, you know, this, this would just, um, as, a, as a young man, I would start to, you know, run the streets and, and, and you know, violence, the drugs, the gangs. And, I, and, and in sexual sin, the women. And, you know, guys, I can tell you, you know, so many things that this life took me to. But you guys know, you know, where, where, where this type of life, where, where men end up. And so, guys, instead of sharing with you guys, that, with that, guys, I want to tell you all that God has done. You know, guys, I want to share the reason why I stand here, a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. Because, guys, I shouldn't be standing here. And you guys know Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, guys, I stand here, a man who obtained the mercy of God because of his grace. Guys, you know, God didn't give me what I deserve. I don't deserve to be here. I deserve judgment. I deserve death. But guys, instead, he gave me what I don't deserve, and he gave me a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know, guys, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, John shared it. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. 
you know, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And guys, today we have that future. We have that hope with Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, guys, but the life that I chose to live, the choices I made, it got me off of God's plan, the plan that he had for me. And I would end up in two comas. I would let, end up once on life support. You know, guys, and I want to share with you guys two events in my life where God just showed up miraculously. You know, guys, in, in March of 1992, at the age of 17, I was in a car accident. You know, and I went off a cliff in Azusa Canyons, and, you know, speed and, and, and alcohol were involved. You know, and I, I ended up in a coma for close to two weeks. And, guys, I want to share what God did in this accident. You know, I had a grandmother who lived in East L.A., and she loved Jesus. You know, guys, and, and she shared with me that on the day of my accident, that she was there in her backyard, and she was sweeping the floor there. And, and, you know, being from East L.A., she was used to, you know, hearing sirens around the neighborhood. But she, she shared with me how this particular morning, how the sound of the sirens, they were different. And, and she shared with me that something started to be very heavy on her heart. And, and she started to just pray and ask the Lord, just speaking to him there. And she said it got to this point where it was unbearable, this heaviness. And so she, started, she told me that she put down her broom and that she dropped to her knees there on that concrete floor and that she began to cry out to God and just ask him, like, who is it? What is it? And, guys, she would just start praying for somebody there. She would start praying for something there. She didn't know what it was, though. And, guys, while this is taking place in East L.A., you know, guys, it's at the very same time that I was going off the cliff in, in Azusa. Guys, my grandmother was praying for me, and she didn't even know it. You know, guys, what had happened is that I went off this cliff, speeding, you know, being foolish. We tumbled twice in, in the, in the, on, on the road. We went, I went off the cliff. My friend flew out the side window. I went off the cliff in the car, and I hit an angle on that cliff. And when I hit that angle, my body was, you know, ejected out of the car through the windshield. And so I was stumbled the rest of the way down to the bottom of that canyon, and the car guys, you know, came back, you know, tumbling behind me. And when the car finally came to a rest, you know, it would land on top of me. And the catalytic converter would burn my whole lower back. And, you know, I was later told that the reason why, you know, that car didn't kill me that day was because I was ejected out of the car. You know, because the car was all smashed in on all sides, top and bottom. You know, and because, too, I was told that I, I lived that day was because of the, on the bottom of the canyon, there was a trench that was perfect width in the length of my body. And so the car could not crush me. And so, guys, you know, I don't believe that I lived that day because, you know, I flew out the car. I don't believe that I lived that day because of that trench at the bottom of the car. You know, I believe that I lived that day because of the grace, because of mercy of God, and because he had a plan for me. Amen. You know, guys, fast, fast forward nine years later, guys, my life was just out of control. And because of my sexual sin, you know, guys, I would, I would end up having three sons. You know, guys, and you young brothers, let me share something with you. Make it your aim. To, to, to live a pure life. Make it your aim to not get involved in sexual sin. You know, we may think it's cool to sleep around with women. We may think it's the thing to do. But let me tell you this. Sexual sin will destroy, will hurt, and it would, will, will, will bring pain. You know, children, if, 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 uh, if it comes out of that relationship, it will bring pain to that woman that you're having sexual relationship with. And let me tell you this, it will bring pain to your future wife. And I encourage you, make it an aim to stay pure. Ask God to help you to remove that desire, you know, for sexual sin, whatever sort it is, because they will destroy it. It will destroy your, it, it, will, it will hurt your marriage. It will hurt your future wife. And so, guys, out of this, you know, sinful life, 
You know, I would have these three children, and at the age of 19, I would have my two oldest. And I'm ashamed to say that none of my sons, you know, have the same mother. You know, guy, that I'm still addicted to drugs. You know, our friends are being killed around me. You know, guys, I had built up a lot of anger and a lot of hate, and I became very violent. You know, guys, but this would start changing in 2001 because it's when I met the Lord. And so, guys, I want to share with you guys about two friends that the Lord used in my life for my salvation. You know, Pastor talked yesterday about, you know, friends. You know, and, and so, guys, one is um, Louis Lopez. He was my childhood, you know, best friend growing up. You know, we went in two directions in life. You know, he became a Christian. I didn't. But one thing that Louis did, and he always showed me and displayed the love of Jesus Christ with me. You know, guys, in all that I was doing, and, and you know, he never judged me, you know, he, but he just loved on me. You know, guys, I remember that no matter what condition I was in, you know, or where I was at, if I called him, he was there. You know, guys, and, you know, and then I had another friend. We used to call him Shorty. But I remember one day we, sh we changed his name Shorty. We call started calling him Cowboy because he was putting work in their neighborhood. And, and he loved guns. And, and so, guys, Shorty, you know, he was a knucklehead. But then guess what? He got saved. You know, guys, there was a, a man by the name of Gilbert and Matt who led Shorty, you know, to the Lord. And I'm going to share something a little bit later. But, guys, after Shorty got saved, guys, you know, for a couple weeks, he was going around the neighborhood telling everybody about this Jesus. You know, we thought that he lost it. We thought that he was on a good one. You know, and... and and he, you know, and so he comes to this place where I'm at. It's just me and him right there in this room. And he starts to share the gospel with me. He tells me that Jesus loved me. He was telling me that, that he died for my sins, that he wanted to forgive me for all of the bad stuff I did. He, I remember those words. You know, guys, that I just had to put my belief, that I just had to put my faith in what Jesus did for me. You know, before this, guys, I had heard the gospel so many times several times but guys it was always easy for me to reject it but guys when shorty shared it with me that day guys it started to really penetrate my heart and i remember i was getting angry and i tried to shut him up and i started to smoke dope and i even offered him to you know to smoke dope and, and guy then he rejected it and i thought to myself okay if you're gonna reject dope i know you won't reject the gun because he loved guns and and so i tried to give him a gun and guys, he rejected that too. And I remember that he told me, he says, I don't need that because I got this. And then he pulled out a little pocket Bible and he showed it to me. And I know who gave him that Bible. You know, guys, this was the last time that I saw Shorty or I spoke to him. Because, you know, a couple of days after that day, he would end up getting shot and killed. And guys, I am sure that he was preaching the gospel. And I bet he was preaching it to the enemy. And, and so he got killed. You know, guys, in my life, the seed already had been planted, you know, had been watered, and then God would ultimately give the increase. You know, guys, just a little over a year, you know, from when Shorty got shot, you know, guys, in March of 2001, at the age of 26, I was shot twice. You know, guys, me and some couple of friends, we were in this garage, and I had my back towards the garage door, and I was looking under the hood of a car. You know, I had a stash spot in there. But guys, all of a sudden, this guy, he runs up, and he just starts shooting into the garage, and three of us get shot. You know, guys, the first bullet, it hit me on, the, on my upper leg, and it knocked me down. Um, and then I, when I'm trying to get back up, the second bullet just missed the top of my head, and it went in my back, went a long ways down my body, and, and it hit my, my, my kidney. And so, guys, here I am, guys, the second time on a dying bed in a hospital. You know, guys, this time I was in a medically induced coma for about a week. And, guys, my body just went into to trauma, started to affect my organs. My other kidney was shutting down. My lungs were failing. Had bullet fragments all over my chest. And, guys, I got put on life support. You know, a machine was helping me breathe. You know, guys, and what I'm going to share next, I have never shared, you know, openly. I've never shared what I experienced, you know, in this coma. But, you know, I, a couple of people, you know, my wife knows, and I told some, one other person. But, guys, you know, I believe that, you know, I, I wrestle with God about sharing, but I believe that the Lord really wants me to share what I experienced in this coma with you guys. You know, guys, in this coma, I experienced something spiritual. You know, 
And I can tell you this, guys, that there is a spiritual war for the souls of the unsaved. Guys, and if I had died that day, I would be in hell today. You know, guys, in this coma, I felt like I was trapped in my body. It was dark. You know, the, 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 and guys, you know, this darkness, you know, it's something like you, you can't explain it with words. And, you know, I came, if I had to say our English words to describe this darkness that I was in, you know, I, I came in across this verse just this week in Jude verse 13. Jude, called, Jude was referring to a darkness, and he said, the blackness of darkness. And, guys, there was an evilness in this darkness that I was in. You know, most of the time in this coma, I would build up saliva, you know, on the sides of that tube that, you know, was going down my throat that, you know, that was helping me breathe. And, guys, and I felt like I was drowning, you know, and I was able to have conversations with myself. I felt like I was conscious. You know, I would, I would start to have moments where I can hear, you know, people, but nothing made no sense at all. And, guys, and I remember that I would try to yell out for help because I wanted to get out of there. And, and, and nobody can hear me. And, and then I, and I was so scared. And, and then, guys, it came to a point you know, where, where my fear, it turned into terror because I began to be tormented by demons. You know, guys, out of this darkness that I was in, several demonic faces, they would start to manifest themselves in this darkness. And guys, these faces were even darker than the darkness that I was in. You know, guys, they would, they would be mocking me, laughing at me. And guys, they would be, bring terror you know, to me by just making a bunch of these laughing, screeching noises, guys. And, and guys, and I could not get out of this. You know, I don't know how long that I was being tormented, but it seemed like it was forever. I thought that I was going to go crazy. I felt like I was going crazy. You know, guys, and here I am in this darkness, alone, being tormented by demons. You know, guys, and out of nowhere... I began to feel this drawing out of the darkness. You know, guys, and God would demonstrate his own love towards me there in that darkest hour of mine. You know, guys, I didn't know it at the time, but it was the Spirit of God who came alongside of me and who started to convict me of the sin of not believing in Jesus. It was a feeling of love that wanted to set me free. And I didn't understand it at that time. You know, I started to be reminded of my friend Louis, who, who ministered to me the love of Jesus Christ. You know, I started to be reminded of the words of Shorty, you know, that day when he shared the gospel with me. You know, and I, and I would start to say to God the words that Shorty gave me, I'm sorry for all the bad things that I have done. And I would start to confess my sin. And I, and I would confess Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior at that moment. And you know, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, guys, and it was from that moment, the darkness, the torment, the demons, they were gone. You know, guys, every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And so, guys, all of a sudden, I see this really bright light. And I, I really had, thought, maybe just had this conversation with myself. I think I'm dead. Well, on a good note, it looks like I'm going to heaven. <laughs> but, guys, that was not, I said, the baptism worked. The Our Fathers, the Hail Marys, they worked. But, guys, it wasn't that. It was just a life fixture on top of the hospital bed that I was at. <laughs> that's, that's a true story. And, guys, then I started to see, finally, no more darkness. It, I started to see shadows of people moving around my hospital bed. You know, my hearing was still faint, but I could understand more. You know, I started to hear the machines that, you know, connected to me, the beeping of the machines. And, 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 and I heard bits and pieces of my friend Louis there on my hospital bed praying for me. You know, guys, I would be, begin to have this peace and discomfort that I cannot even explain. And for the first time, 
since high school. I had joy in that. I had joy. You know, guys, I was finally able to rest because Jesus Christ, the light of the world, he stepped into my darkness to be with me at that moment. You know, guys, my mom shared. You know, my mom has shared with me how at one point, you know, tears just were coming down, flooding down the sides of my face. And I really do believe, guys, that it was at this time because I was resting with Jesus. You know, the Lord would touch, you know, my other kid, and he would heal it, and he would breathe the breath of life into my lungs. I would be, be removed from that, you know, life support machine, and the Lord would just not only heal me physically there, but also spiritually because Jesus called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, guys, and by the grace and the mercy of God, guys, I would leave that hospital a saved man. You know, guys, I later, you know, attended my friend's church, and I went up there publicly, and I, you know, confessed the Lord, as my, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. And I wish that I could stand here, guys, and tell you guys that from that moment forward that I walked faithfully with the Lord, but that was not the case because, guys, I turned my back on God two times. You know, and for the next six years, I would be up and down in my relationship with the Lord. You know, and, I, you know, after I got shot, you know, my mom, she moved out of Baldwin Park, and she moved here to Ontario. That's how I ended up out here. You know, but, guys, I had, again, been running the streets and doing meth, angry. And, and, and after, you know, about six months of being out there, just doing dope every day again, you know, I went to this house to go sell dope. And I remember going into this restroom and they, the mirror, I, I looked in the mirror, and I remember seeing myself dying slowly. I had lost a lot of weight from doing meth for six months. And I remember, I hate what I saw. I saw that old man, that old Louie. And, and I remember the guys that I, I just began to weep and to cry because I was convicted, because I had turned my back on God. And I remember I, I flushed that dope. And I left that house, and I would call my mom, and I said, Mom, I'm coming home. And she said, no, mijo, you cannot come here no more. And guys, for the very first time, my mom rejected me. Everybody else had rejected me, but my mom never did. But guys, you know what? It was the best thing that my mom ever did for me. Because guys, I would call my friend Louie, and he would come and pick me up. And, and, you know, take me to his house, and he kept me there, and then he took me to a Christian men's home. And guys, I want to share two things that I learned in this Christian men's home. One, I learned the power of God's word to transform a life. You know, not because I was taught that, because, but because I experienced it. You know, guys, my life verse, John shared it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You know, when I first came across this verse, I really believed it. I really believed that I was no longer that old man and that I was a new man in Jesus Christ. And you guys know it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I believe that. You know, guys, God then started to strip things off of me that were getting in the way of my relationship with me, with, you know, with him in that, in, in that home. And the biggest of these was unforgiveness. And so the second thing that I had learned in that home was how to forgive. You know, one morning, God was dealing with me about forgiving my enemies because that's what had taken me back to the neighborhood in the first place. You know, guys, and out we, at this home, we had these times where we used to gather in a room, and, and, and we had the opportunity to share something that the Lord put on our heart. And so I shared about loving your enemies, about forgiving the way God has forgiven you. And so that's what I share, and little did I know that God would put me to the test later on that day, that night, actually. You know, guys, so a brother Lorenzo, he was a leader in the home, um, but he comes and he wakes me up, and he says, and I quote, he says, he says, hey, Louis, wake up. He goes, there's an essay who's trying to come into the home, but he don't want to talk to me because I think I'm black. So, so, so he tells me that. So, guys, so, so he wakes me up, and I wake up, and I go into this intake room where, you know, men would come in, and standing there, guys, it's a guy from the gang who had shot me, and we knew each other. And, guys, he was so messed up. And at that moment... <laughs> You know, God gave me compassion for this guy. And I was able to share the gospel with him. 
I was able to lead him, and he accepted the Lord as his personal Lord and Savior that night. Look, I don't know. I do not know why this guy was there. But I remember I told the brothers, don't, get this, don't let this dude get, get, you know, by my bed when I'm asleep. I didn't try to. But I don't know why he was there. But, that, you know, because the next morning when I woke up, he was gone. But right there and then, God healed my heart. He removed the hate. He removed the anger, the revenge. And he touched my heart that day. And that day, I was able to forgive, and I learned how to forgive. You know, so I get out of this home. I'm doing good. I'm going to church. I get a pretty good job. And so, guys, I start dealing with, you know, a time where I started being tempted to do meth again. And I give in to the temptation, and I turn my back on God once again. I go back to the neighborhood. And, you know, this time, you know, I'm out there, and I run into this girl who I had ran the streets for a lot of years with. You know, and one night, we got high together, and I remember the high guys was not the same. It was never the same when I went back. The parting was not the same because, you see, guys, when you taste and see that the Lord is good, returning to your vomit, it's never going to be the same. Don't believe that lie. It's not. You know, one day I was there getting high with this girl, and I remember, guys, that I started to weep because, again, I was being convicted because I had turned my, my back on God. And I remember looking at her, and I remember thinking that God loved her. I remember thinking that God created her, that he cared for her. I remember thinking that she had a father who loves her. And, guys, and I wanted to tell her about Jesus, but how could I? I was high. <coughs> You know, guys, and here I am, a so-called Christian, and, you know, a so-called Christian, and I'm getting this girl high on methamphetamine. You know, guys, I had never felt, you know, feelings for women like this, but God already had started to transform my heart, started to change it. And so, guys, around this time, I was offered a position, you know, to, you know in my job. You know, and, and so, you know, the position was out of state in Idaho, and so I took the position, I needed to get out of here. I just needed to leave because I was going to just keep returning to my vomit being here. And so I asked here, turning my back on God again, I asked this girl if she wanted to go with me to, to Idaho, and she said yes. And so we moved to Idaho in 2006, and, you know, we, we start going to a Calvary Chapel there, Calvary Chapel, Burley, Idaho. And we're, you know, we're, we're there, but we're living in sin, and, you know, we're playing church, and we're playing games with God. And, you know, one, one day I got to the point where I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired for letting God down. And, guys, in March of 2007, I would fully surrender my life to God. And I, I remember this one day I pleaded with him. I begged him. I fell on my face. I, I cried and cried, and I asked him, Lord, take this addiction from me. It keeps pulling me away from my relationship with you. And guys, and I remember that day, that was the last time that I used meth. I did not go through no withdrawals. I did not go through no temptations. And God set me free that day from meth. And, and it was even. <laughs> and this girl that I'm living with, she also, you know, surrenders to the Lord. And she gets saved in March of 2007. Well, let me share something, guys. It was a man named Gilbert and a man named Matt who shared the gospel with my friend Shorty. Gilbert's my father-in-law. Matt's my brother-in-law. Because they shared the gospel with Shorty. Shorty shared the gospel with me. And the fruit, now her, their daughter and their sister, is coming to the Lord. You never know what God's going to do when you share the gospel with somebody. Every opportunity you get, share the gospel So she ends up getting saved, and God, I start to have this desire to be used by God, but God, I knew that God couldn't use me because I was living in sin. You know, so guys, in September of 2007, I married this girl. You guys know her, my wife, Becky. Some of you guys call her Becca. Somebody calls her sad girl. She serves on the worship team, but guys, I don't deserve her, but God gave her to me. 
You know, guys, from that moment that we got married, God would begin to use me, you know, in the ministry. And I had the opportunity to minister in Calvary Chapel in Burley, Idaho. And, and, and it was there that I learned how to, you know, serve the Lord, how to be a servant. You know, the Lord would just transform my life, guys. And, you know, for nine, you know, years, you know, in, after nine years in Idaho, you know, the Lord will bring us back here to, to California, you know, in September of 2017. You see, guys, I wanted to come back here because, you know, I had that desire because to this day I am praying for my sons. You know, the consequence of my sin, I don't have a relationship with my sons. And I pray for their salvation and I pray that one day the Lord will, find, will put in their heart to find them to forgive me. You know, that's one reason why I came. But, you know, you know John shared at a Mark chapter 5. You know, another reason that I came, because this very same verse God gave me when he gave me the desire to want to be back. You know, in, in Mark chapter 5, in verse 19, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. Well, little did I know, you know, as I came back and since I've been here, I have had the opportunity to share the gospel with my mom, with my dad. They are saved and they come to this church. You know, guys, I thank the Lord for leading us here to my church, to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, here where I have learned from my pastor by his example how to love the word of God and how to love my wife. You know, guys, it is here that I get to serve God, you know, to, by serving the men in our men's ministry. You know, guys, I'm not perfect. And the Lord is still doing so much work in my life. You know, but one thing I've learned is I've learned to appreciate the grace and the mercy of God. You know, brothers, I am a testimony of, love, of God's love. I am the testimony, you know, of God's long suffering and his patience. I am the testimony of his grace and of his mercy. Guys, and here's my testimony. I was blind, but now I see. You know, guys, and by the grace of God... By the grace of God, I have been married, and I have been sober for over 16 years. And guys, God is good. You know, God is good, and he deserves all of the glory. He deserves all of the honor, all of the praise. He deserves, and it's all the power is him. And I'm here to testify that God is good. And guys, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I thank Jesus for the cross. I thank him for dying for my sins that I have been forgiven. We are forgiven. and God bless you. Amen.